Now I'll let you uh, decide to put it down. And then when, after your introduction, you could start. You want to do that? Uh, yes, that Go sounds, on. sure. That sounds good. Okay. All right. Sounds good. I'm sure we can figure it out. And the kid, everybody <laughs> yeah, right. wait five minutes. Okay, I have just started the recording. And uh, welcome everyone to the first CUNY Research Scholars Program COVID-19 Town Hall. Uh, we're very grateful to all of our speakers and to all of the attendees for joining us in what should be uh, an exciting uh, first in a series of town halls that the CUNY Research Scholars Program will be sponsoring. And uh, I would like to thank uh, first the, the other members of the committee uh, that have helped to put this together, Dr. Lucia Fuentes and Dr. Allison Sheffield. Uh, I, I wanna especially uh, mention that Dr. Fuentes uh, really originated this entire program because uh, at LaGuardia College, uh, she noted that there was a kind of need for the community to come together and uh, disseminate information, gather information, ask questions. Uh, and of course she took that a step further and even had her students translate COVID-19 pamphlets into, uh, into multiple different languages that they could distribute around not only Queens, but apparently some of them have had a bit of an international reach. Uh, so uh, we really do kind of, all of this owes back to Dr. Fuentes, thank you very much, uh, and to the whole LaGuardia community for uh, having been so pre proactive uh, all the way back in, in March and April. Uh, so the way that the town hall will work is uh, we have uh, five speakers. Uh, I will introduce each one just before they speak. Uh, most of them will have uh, anywhere between five and 10 minutes when they speak. Uh, and uh, because Dr. Zakari has to leave early, we're going to do a little question and answer uh, period with Dr. Zakari before she goes. Uh, with all the other speakers, we will uh, be, uh, all the speakers will speak in order and then we will go to the large question and answer format. Uh, and we really look forward to all of your questions. You can post them in the chat. And Dr. Ellis, Allison Sheffield and I will uh, try to manage the chat so that uh, all of the questions uh, can be asked. Uh, and uh, I also just want to mention- uh, Oh, I, I'm sorry, I, I should ask you to, a, to mute themselves. Uh, please, uh, everyone, mute okay. yourself. Yeah, you know what I know in Jessica. Uh, let's see. I think I, think I found uh, the speaker, uh, and um, and then uh, if you want to ask oral questions, you can unmute yourself uh, at the end. Um, so, uh, without further ado, uh, we will start with our first speaker, Dr. Uh, Zara Zakari. And uh, I will read uh, a bit of her biography and then she will speak for uh, the first five to 10 minutes uh, with an introduction to virology and the coronavirus structure. I should, I, I'm sorry, the first 10 minutes. Um, so Dr. Zakari received her PhD from St. John's University and continued as a postdoctoral fellow and associate research scientist at Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. She taught at the Robert Wood Johnson Medical School, University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey before moving to Queens College, where she is professor of biology and director of the MARC program. She has served on numerous grant review panels in the US, Ireland, Italy, Belgium, Israel, and Iran. She is on, she is on the editorial boards of several journals and as a reviewer for many journals. Her research has touched on many areas of cell death, including stress and heat shock genes, ceramide and shingomyelin, autophagy and phagocytosis, cell death in development and aging, cyclin-dependent kinases, the role of apoptosis and 
you can see that I am a sociologist and not a, a biologist. Uh, and teratogenicity, uh, viral manipulation in cell death, and the role of genetic sex on sensitivity to cell death. She has co-edited several books, including two volumes of Methods in Enzymology. She was a co-founder of the first Gordon Conferences on Cell Death in the International Cell Death Society for which she is currently president. She has won several awards, including most recently an award as ambassador for science by the International Cell Death Society. She has organized meetings nationally and internationally in countries such as Australia, Brazil, France, Iran, Ireland, Italy, Spain, South Africa, the United States and Turkey. She has won almost $15 million in grant support and has served on many national and international grant communities, uh, committees. She has published almost 100 papers and chapters, including six books and is a frequent international speaker, both in her field and as a representative of women in science. Uh, Dr. Zakari, welcome. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now let's see if we can do this correctly. How about that? You share? Share. Thank you very much. It, I am delighted to be, uh, is my sound okay? I hope. Yes, it is. Yes. yes, okay. yes I can um, I'm delighted to be here and I thank especially uh, Dr. Intizari for uh, inviting me and uh, Ron Nora for doing all of this hard work. Um, since I have very little time, I will just um, jump into what I thought might be useful for this first talk, an introduction to COVID uh, virus. And um, I have to right out said, uh, thank one of my colleagues, uh, Kayvon Zandi at Emory, who has uh, given me a lot of the information and some nice slides to present to you as well as um, what I have added to it. So let's just start with some terminology review. SARS-CoV-2, this is the name of the virus that we will refer to. And the disease is called coronavirus um, disease 2019 or COVID-19. That's how the name has gone. Just in case some of you are not familiar what the word pandemic is, is an, basically an epidemic that affects worldwide over a wide variety of areas and cross international bar barrier and usually affecting a large number of people. So what is what we know a little bit about the history of this uh, disease is that the first coronavirus infection was in 1960s and um, they basically introduced itself as a common cold and, uh, and many people got it and not so many fatalities until about 2002 or so, there were different subforms and virus, and we always associated them with a common cold. About 2002 was the first uh, sort of fatal um, or lethal um, acute respiratory syndrome that we were termed SARS. Uh, I'm not sure how to use my how my pointer is coming around here, but let me just see. Uh, uh, it's okay. I think you can. I don't know if you see my pointer or not, but yes. Okay, good. SARS, uh, which caused coronavirus syndrome, which uh, was uh, basically uh, started to uh, kill people. And about 2012, I have to also get it a bit. Okay. Around 2012 was when um, a second wave or a different uh, type of uh, this virus uh, appeared. And it is called MERS, which is with Middle Eastern. It's originated in Saudi Arabia and is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And it's uh, many people have gotten affected, uh, more than 2,000 and about 858. Now, this virus still is in Middle East and it hasn't completely been eradicated. It's just gone a bit less and is not as active because of uh, many intervention. And about December 2019 is when in uh, China, we uh, started to see a different type of uh, or different oh, yeah. of the COVID-19 uh, and the respiratory disease that started producing uh, what was called a pneumonia. And that was called SARS-CoV-2. 
and uh, it is spread very rapidly and it transmission and up to what I looked at around October 11, the day before my birthday actually, that there are over 380 million people have over in the world have gotten this disease and over a million people have died. So the disease is a real disease. Whoever is telling you otherwise, don't believe them. So what is this virus made of? The structure of the virus, coronavirus is a spherical uh, envelope virus. And uh, it's, the envelope is made out of projecting glycoprotein, which is, surrounds a core matrix and is a single stranded positive sense RNA virus, okay? And this is associated with nuclear proteins. The envelope has glycoproteins that are responsible for its attachment to the cells. And later on, I'll show you in a minute, entry into the different cells and is also the main antigenic episode, which I'm sure that other uh, people who are talking here will address more and more. So if you look here, down here, at a, uh, sort of an image of this virus, this is the RNA, the positive sense RNA, and these are the proteins. One of the most interesting, or, or one of the proteins that are really people are working on a lot to try to develop different things is called the spike protein. The spike protein is where many people are now trying to you know, use for intervention and also detection to use different methodology, which I touch on some of them. So here, unfortunately, I don't see on this part. Can you see this or are you seeing just people here? Um, I don't know if you see them, but what is said all over here is different types or similarities between different uh, viruses, the MERS, the SARS. I don't know how to get rid of this. There we go. Okay. Um, the different COVID and different um, variation that I was just telling you about, that there are similarities and differences between them. So when the virus gets into the cell, this is what it does. It attaches on the cell surface or it could do what is called surface fusion. The aim of the virus in general, or many of the viruses or all the viruses is they're like, you can think of them as a parasite. They want to get into your virus cells and use everything that the cell has for their own benefit. Some of them use the cell so much and they exhaust and the cell bursts and dies. And that's what we are very interested to in that to see what it triggers, what type of cell death of machinery, and either if preventing the cells to die or killing it before the virus is mature, it would be an advantage to downregulate or antiviral um, uh, sort of procedures. But in this case, it gets, remember the spikes uh, proteins that I told you, it gets attached to the surface of the cells, then it endocytos becomes inside the cells and the membranes ruptures and the RNA, the single strand RNA comes out. Uses the cellular machinery and whatever the cell has, and it starts making up more baby viruses and it releases into the cell. The cell surface fusion bypasses this endocytosis and it could go directly to that. Both of this can happen and does happen depending in the cell. So what are the clinical clinical symptoms of this virus. And again, all of these that I say, fever, cough, sore throat, fatigue, shortness of breath, headaches, muscle aches, sudden loss of smell or taste, diarrhea, could happen individually or in combination on the virus. Now, one of the things that one has to know, as humans, we are extremely different from each other. And therefore, each one of us have different immune repertoire and can get any diseases and not only kill with any diseases with variation. That's what makes uh, even doing a therapy or doing anything in cancer or in Alzheimer very difficult because nothing works. One thing does not work for the entire human population. We are different genetically and we have different susceptibility. And that's why COVID actually, we don't know all how and why, that is happening, but affects different people to different degrees. So a symptom can start one day after exposure, but it could also last 14 days, and in some cases much longer. And some people could have no symptoms. They have very mild 
disease or they could have very severe disease that kills them. And as you know, over 2015 people have died in US alone in the past four or five months. So it's a very lethal disease. But a lot of people have it and they walk around without anything. It could injure the people, even if you survive, it could have been severely damaged. It could damage kidneys, many of the respiratory system, many other parts like heart, and I will touch on that again. To specify again, there are different symptoms and you could have one, all, or none. And the virus is sort of spreads and emerged from originally thinking that, okay, it's just by touch or something, but it's airborne. So it's by aerosol, I'll talk about that. And it can infect many ages, and even though they, some could get infected less than the others, but the capability of infection is all. And it affects elderly or people who have some pre-morbid uh, symptoms more. So comorbidity uh, has, they're more prone to getting this and being more severely affected. How could we prevent it? Well, it's not, it's very simple and it's not very simple. So simply what we could do is avoid, wash our hands, avoid traveling around. You know, these all diminishes the risk. The more of these things you do all together, the better or the less of a chance of getting it and getting it very badly. So high risk areas, don't go there. When you say travel, it doesn't mean just getting on the uh, train or, or um, going away from where you are. It also means going to a bar, going to a restaurant. I think we could all survive not having that drink in a bar, but we won't survive this, uh, this sickness or our parents will not survive this sickness if they get it. So think about that. Avoiding contacts with individuals. Now, a lot of people are asymptomatic. They could have it and shed it and not respond, not know it even, or not even, and that was the main problem originated this whole pandemic, is that people didn't really realize that you can be not showing any symptoms and shedding the virus tremendously. And that's how it is spread everywhere. So avoiding those things, basic hygiene and PPE, especially wearing masks. You wear the mask to avoid giving that disease to anybody else. And if you think you don't have it, you don't know because you could be one of the asymptomatic people who have it and is giving it to others. So wash hands, avoid contact with sick people, but also other people. Stay home as much as you can. Don't touch your hands or face. And that's really amazing how many times we do that. And if you have any symptoms that is getting worse, please go and report it. So how this thing is transmitted, there's a various way, way of transmission, but the best way that it could get you sick is by aerosol. Yes, it is aerosol. It goes by droplets. Now droplets, you know how that is when people are talking, you don't even see the droplets, but I'm sure many of you, because if you go on these YouTubes or anything, you see that they have done these beautiful animations sort of things of looking at how far the droplets could go. And there is a lot of experiments on those things. And they could go pretty far distance. Even though we say six feet distant, they could go much farther than that and affect one person who has not even received the disease. So stay away from each other as much as you can. And I know that we're all getting a little bit more relaxed in New York thinking, well, uh, and if it's true that the probability has gone down is like 1%, so one in a hundred, you know, people might be having it, but that's still for me, one too many. And, um, you know, don't get relaxed, keep the work that we did, that's how we got rid of it. So let's just keep on doing the good job. Now, there is a lot of controversies about how long this thing stays on different surfaces, because I know in the beginning, me, like many other people, were going totally crazy, wiping everything that in sight. And to a degree, that's not a bad idea. The five days ago, there was a report that I will talk to you more about it on discussion if you have more questions. Mm -hmm. and some of the items, this could stay on to up to a month. And I could tell you if you want to know more after I present that time permit, uh, what are the circumstances that that could happen? 
Now, COVID, there are many, many um, laboratories that are doing a diagnostic test and trying to figure out how to do that. And that's the testing that we so desperately need to increase. And uh, unfortunately, there are some powers to be that don't think that's important, but that is important. And the more testing we do, the more we know how things are happening, the better we are and the more we could keep the virus in check. So you could check for different things. You can check for the virus itself. And that is done by looking for the antigen, for the proteins, for the different uh, antibodies that are proteins of the virus that might be available in your uh, body or in somebody's body. But one of the best ones that actually definitely will tell you are the RT-PCR. Both of them are time dependent on their ex how much they are and how good they are, depending on when they do the test during the disease or infection. So we can talk about that later too, if you want to know more. And there's also immune response. There are antibodies against COVID-19 antigens that one could use to look at the availability of the antibody. So for the response of the body, your body, and the response of the virus. I'm sure um, Dr. Entazari will tell you about immune response. So transmission could occur in, um, as I keep telling you, in despite the absence of the symptoms. So you can feel pretty okay and do that. And there are, I'm not gonna go through every one of them, but there are quite a few examples and studies who have been done to see that there are people who actually never really do anything. They are positive and they never even uh, present it. Um, the first time I think I really, am, uh, learn about these things for people who had AIDS and they were positive for the virus, but they never showed the, uh, the disease. And that was very interesting. And they're still working on that even today. So this is another virus that can actually affect you and you don't, you shed the disease and you shed the virus and you don't have the sickness. So it's quite interesting. And those people are really, should be very well in, uh, studied and understood. Now there's a controversy about children and how much they get. So they have a different types of immune system. And because of that, or because of other things, they don't seem to be as sick. And also they don't seem to be giving it to other people as much. However, this study is very immature. Everything we know about COVID-19 is immature. We only started to really learn about this particular COVID since March. And that's when everything started it. We, I mean, in US, in our neighborhood. So therefore, we have to learn a lot and take everything that everybody says with a grain of salt, because there has to be extensive studies in every part to make sure that we could make leaps of, uh, you know, information and say, this is absolutely what it happens. And every time that you hear something, keep in mind that every individual has different genetics and we can have different responses. But having said that, there are some studies and some points that now people are gathering information. Up to now, up to date, this many things have happened and different backgrounds are uh, more susceptible and children seem to be less likely to die from this, but they still die. And that could be because of the transmission and also how their immune system works. COVID is a very, very um, horrible disease in a sense that it does it affects a multitude of your organs. So it can affect the brain, the lung, intestine, kidney, blood vessels, and heart. That's why people go through this really horrible death in a sense when the, the disease gets out of control. So it's, it's a respiratory a disease, but it could also affect many other organs as well. So the potential antivirus, whenever we work on the virus, and my laboratory particularly has been working on influenza virus, dengue virus, and Zika virus. And when we are looking at these viruses, we are trying to make antiviral targets or antiviral therapy. And to do that, you have to know your virus, you have to know where it attacks, what is going on, what part of the cell it is touching, and therefore go and try to block those pathways. So any virus that you know, and you know the viral cycle, that everybody starts developing things to block it at different entry points, translational points, making exit points, et cetera. 
And also, if you have the virus coming out, how could you neutralize it so it cannot affect another cell? That's where a lot of the antiviral cocktails, which our president took very early in his disease from Regeneron, takes it. Unfortunately, most of us have no access to those cocktails. So we are in not as such a good shape as he was. Now, at, when you have all of these, there are many people who have been working very hard for 24 hours a day to develop and use drugs which have been used for viruses in order to be able to see whether it has an effect as a therapy. So therapeutics would be when you have the disease and there are different parts of this link. There's early infection, mid-infection, and really late. So there are different parts, again, that these uh, therapeutic uh, so-called drugs are being used to work and try to actually um, uh, block or downplay the viruses. But uh, like remdesivir, which is another drug that our president took, uh, it's not a cure for all. And actually, just recently, I haven't even finished reading the article, that there have been a report coming out that maybe it's not as good as everybody thinks. And I was pretty depressed because I was hoping that this would be a very nice disease that I can't tell you why they don't think it is, but because I, as I said, I haven't finished my um, search on that research on it, but there, at least for some people it works. Again, for some people, a lot of things seems to be good, but not for all and not for any. These are a repertoire of many drugs and this was the, uh, put together by a number of uh, reports that shows that there are possibilities. Some of them do something, some of them absolutely nothing. So you are, for current COVID treatment that we have, obviously, aside from the fact that all of these people who are in frontline workers, I cannot tell you how appreciative I am. I've always been appreciative of the nurses more than anybody else in the world. Uh, having gone to hospitals a couple of times myself, how wonderful they are. And without them, we all would be dead when we go to the hospital. But there is, we basically had to learn how to deal with disease. When it hit us in the beginning, we had no idea. We thought it was pneumonia. And a lot of people treated it as that. And that was not such a good idea for some people. Then they learned maybe they should use different strategy. And all of these came out from really just working with the doctors and the nurses right there, trying to figure out how to deal with it. So the other way to do it is to use antiviral drugs, direct antivirus drugs that we, such as this, oops, sorry about that, such as remdesivir, to, to try to interfere with viral growth and viral expansion, to try to do that. You could also do host-based um, approaches, such as targeting important host element for the virus replication. So where some of it works and some of it does not, you could also do immunomodulators. Now, one of the things that has been, and I'm sure Maria is gonna talk about this, is cytokine storm, which affects basically all the organs and especially the lungs. And the cytokine storm is seen in many, many cases. And uh, so the most familiar one are the rheumatoid, um, rheumatic uh, diseases or rheumatoid arthritic diseases. Uh, these people uh, have what is called a cytokine storm. Anytime they get an infection of some sort, their body starts, the immune system starts fighting the infection and then doesn't know when to start, stop and start fighting their joints and their other parts of their body, like kidneys, like in lupus and things like that. And dexamethasone is a steroid that is often used for many of these diseases. And there are other ones too, and some of them which we don't want to talk about right now. That is not really work. But this one particularly seems to be working. And this is another drug that our president took to assure that he doesn't go to recite on his own. And of course, there are many other uh, parts like anticoagulant and things like that to try to basically save the patient by that time it's kind of very late in the disease. The best thing you want to do is to start very early and to block the expansion of the, um, or the growth of the virus. Now, I thank you. I don't know if it's 10 minutes or not. I talk as fast as I could. And I really want to again uh, thank my uh, colleague, um, uh, Kevon Zandi. And if we could somehow put this um, talk on a corner, so if 
uh, you have a question that I could answer, I'd be happy to do that. I don't know what happened. Oh, there it is. Somewhere over there. Okay. Ron, Ron, you're muted. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, as I mentioned, uh, Dr. Zakari does have to leave a little early. So uh, we're going to do a question and answer period right now with Dr. Zakari, and then the other speakers will come on. We'll hold all the remaining questions until the end. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Zakari. And we do have several questions in the chat. Other people should feel free also to enter their questions. Um, uh, Allison Sheffield and I will field the questions. Uh, Allison, you want to uh, start with the first one? Sure. The first question is about the role of epigenetics. So the question is, how does epigenetics play a role in immunity with vaccines regarding this virus? And further, do we need more testing in order to design better vaccines, given the fact that everyone reacts differently according to their DNA and susceptibility? Okay, so um, thank you. I, I have to say that the vaccine situation, I didn't touch on it because I thought somebody, you know, 10 minutes, it's kind of hard to tell you everything there is about them. So there are different ways that people are making the vaccines and there are different parts of the virus that they are touching. Of course, as I said, epigenetic touches on everything, but it doesn't really, um, until we, that's why we do the trials, right? To, to see which ones, sort of bypasses that the um, subtle questions of epigenetics that we each have, all right, and differences that we each have. So um, in order for uh, you to use the vaccine, we have to make sure that these vaccines have been vetted quickly and correctly, and they are not just rushed to, the, uh, to everybody because of the timing. So therefore, um, you have seen probably that there have been pauses in some of the vaccine production. There are different types of vaccines being made to different parts of the um, uh, different organizations of the virus. So um, I would say that uh, if the result comes out that thousands of people have been tested, uh, I would feel pretty uh, okay about using the vaccines. And what was the second part? I don't remember. I think I answered that. Yeah, the second part was, you did, um, just about okay. more testing for better vaccines. Yeah. yeah. And there's another question um, about, so if this is similar, you mentioned um, a lot of people are asymptomatic. So the question is, is this the same as hepatitis C in that respect, in that some people uh, show symptoms? Uh, well, I'm not sure if it's the same. It's just the fact that, you know, we don't really know at the moment why all the people who don't uh, show symptoms, don't show symptoms, okay? There are some anecdotal uh, work has been done. I am absolutely sure there are a lot of people working on it 24 seven, you know? And uh, we have to be very careful of what um, comes out of the papers because I was just given two or three papers to review about these things. And a lot of things are really questionable. You can't have like 10 people or two, uh, five people in your sample size and make a big, uh, you know, um, in-depth uh, conclusions. So um, I don't think we know exactly why they're asymptomatic right now. So that's something that is it their genetic, is it something very specific about their uh, immune system, what's going on? And I think there's a lot of work being done. So I couldn't tell you exactly why that's the case. Okay, uh, thank you. There were two questions related to weather and temperature. Uh, the first one was, how does the virus react to temperature? Is it affected by the weather? Uh, and someone responded to that and said, RNA survives in the cold and can degrade at warmer temperatures. Since mm -hmm. COVID is RNA, that may apply. I could be wrong though. Okay. Do you have a perspective on that? Sure, okay, so um, viruses in general are uh, much, they survive longer in the cold weather. Like uh, influenza viruses specifically, for example, if you know you get flu in the cold weather, that's because it could travel more distance and it could linger much better and survive better. Uh, COVID is being uh, pointing out that that's also the case for the COVID. For example, yes, it is an RNA virus, it gets degraded, but the RNA is encapsulated by all of this protein, right? 
So it, it's not exposed. If it was exposed, of course, it wouldn't survive any temperature. Uh, even in the cold, it might die, uh, unless it's in a very degraded, because it's a single-stranded RNA. But it doesn't express itself as such. What it expresses itself is the particles. And they are particles within the uh, cervical, usually in a droplet. So in the cold, it stays longer, and the heat is supposedly goes down. However, we know very well that COVID, it's not that it's ineffective in the hot either. In the water, it just doesn't go as far. So if you think about places that have been very hot, like Australia, right? And um, Africa, I know for a fact in uh, my colleagues in Africa, they have had COVID and it's much hotter. Florida uh, in the summertime has had, uh, so I think in a temperature, as far as surface is concerned, if you remember, I told you, I put that little thing on the bottom and I said, even though we think within 24 hours or seven days or something, uh, the recent results are saying that some surfaces like uh, solid surfaces like cardboard and steels, and that's very important to know these things, the virus could stay there for a month if it's dark and if it's cold. So how many of you guys take the food from somewhere and then the first thing we do is stick it in a plastic wrap in the refrigerator, right? And that keeps everything alive instead of killing it. So a, a simple wiping it with anything would be much better than putting it just like that there. Um, and one of the main reason that is important is like when you open doorknobs, when you go to a lot of places, um, really wash your hands because as it gets colder, those guys are gonna stay longer. So in the heat, maybe they will stay a little less, maybe a few days, but now that it's getting colder, they stay longer. So it's important when you have your kids and they go to school, you know, kids, they touch everything, right? You can't tell them to do this or that. And most of us, including myself, we touch our masks all the time, don't we? So if you are COVID or you're asymptomatic and you touch your hands or you touch your mouth and you touch other things, you're transferring it. Now, having said that, I have to tell you one thing because I would feel uncomfortable not saying it. Although it's really important to do all of this, you need quite a bit of particles of or concentration of the COVID in order to get really sick, okay? So if you get a single thing, unless you're immunocompromised and a single shot uh, will just knock you out, your body could take care of it. So you do need more than one single particle of uh, virus to do that. A low level does not very much activate and causes a havoc. So keep that in mind as well. So that's why we're a little better off right now to go to the supermarket that we were say a uh, long time ago, because even if there's one person who has COVID, the probability of that one person contaminating the entire stop and shop that you go to is a lot less than when there were 25 people going there, right? So keep that in mind as well. I hope it answered your question. Okay. Uh, thank you. And Allison, you want to take the next one? Yeah, so there was a question going back to a little bit of the history that you talked about at the beginning. And what particularly about COVID-19 makes it more viral than its previous versions, or at least more prevalent than the others? Well, I think the lethality, the other ones, first of all, there's a couple of things. One is the uh, infectivity. It seems to be much more infected. It goes a lot faster, it aerosols, it it's, uh, affects a lot more. And the other one is lethality. And, and we don't know why it's, it's doing that, or at least I don't know right now, why is it between this virus and the other one that is killing like that? But of course I showed you the structures, they are different and whether those differences are making it more lethal, it seems to affect. So the virus itself, Okay, it gets in the cell and it just makes more viruses, right? The virus doesn't have a knife that is going to go gun, 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 kill you. But as it affects more of your cells or any virus, as they affect more of your cells, they destroy more and more of your components, all right? And then they, they, your body starts a reaction. And that reaction is what is really killing you, okay? So the reaction and the virus, the virus is... Uh, I'm not sure if I'm explaining this per se, but the effect of the virus is killing us. And we don't know how this virus has the capability to elicit such a strong uh, 
uh, response in some people, right? And if your immune system is already on a, and I'm gonna leave this for Maria to tell you about it because she's gonna tell you about innate immunity and stuff. So if your immune system already is in a low size, you cannot fight the virus. So it starts growing and growing and growing much better. And then as it grows, it affects different cells, it destroys different cells, it destroys the epithelial of the lung, etc. And you don't have the capability of uh, breeding well, and immune system is also in habit. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Let's just do one really quick question and then we'll go on to the next speaker because I know you have to go. Um, uh, one question is, uh, what is your opinion about people who get infected twice? So I guess that means, uh, can people be infected twice? So again, this is one of those places I told you that one of the things, science, unlike what you hear on the Fox News, science is important, guys. And uh, I know we're not supposed to talk about politics and anything, but this is just common sense. And now, scientists have seen, and very anecdotally, I have seen a few papers, but very few cases, that some people report that they got reinfected. Now, there are two things to consider. One is that there's maybe that there's actually a possibility of getting reinfected. And the second thing is that they were never totally viral free. Okay, so you could have a very, very low. Now, when I showed you those two things that the way you look at the virus, one is the PCR. Now, the PCR is going to show you active viral particles that are coming out at the time. So you have to be very sick and there must be a lot of virus for you to have a really good detection of it. So sometimes when you have the virus and it's lower, and you're down and you feel much better, it goes down to a, to a level that we cannot detect. But it may be that it's still there, okay? Now, whether people get it again, that is a possibility that is something we don't really know about this virus that well, but I don't think it's so prevalent right now. There are very, very few cases that I know of that have been reported this is happening. That is a genuine, a new virus. Now, some of them, what is interesting, and I don't know how the virus is doing it, but it is that, you know, that there are very subtle differences between the virus that is in uh, Italy and the virus that came from China, right? I think most of you have heard that in New York, for example, we got the Italian, the European, Italian, um, French, and Spanish sort of thing. We're, uh, we didn't get it from the Chinese virus, as they say. So, uh, or from that particular. There are very subtle differences between them, but the, subtle enough that you could detect and go back and look at it. So what is interesting that I read is that one or two, two come, whether these are two different types of viruses that the person has gotten. So if you had the European one, did you get now the Chinese one? And I didn't really see that. So I don't think they had separated the two or the person who had it, the information wasn't around for which virus they had the first time and which one. So it would be very interesting to do these studies and to really get, because that would tell us about the behavior. But more importantly, I think that's an excellent question, whoever asked that, is that it would tell us also about our vaccine, right? And what our capability is. So you're getting vaccinated. Now, having said that, you have to know that I'm hoping that the vaccines that are going to be developed are going to be a vaccine that is going to recognize different parts, right? Like when you get a flu shot, which I hope that all of you have gotten your flu vaccine, take it from a virologist who works on influenza, it's a good thing. So do that, okay? So if you've gotten your flu vaccine, that is a combination vaccine, right? Because flu has a very high rate of changing and every year we have to get a new repertoire but it's a combination of different possibilities that it could change and it could express itself so i'm pretty sure that that's what's going to be in our vaccines and um i wanted to encourage everybody to do take the vaccine when it comes out but take it when the scientists tell you this is a good vaccine and don't i don't believe an anti-vaccine so if you want to have a townhouse about that another time, I'd be happy to come. Okay, thank you very, very much, Dr. Zakari. Thank you. Thank and you very we much. hope.
we hope to see you again soon. Thank and you I for apologize from the other speakers that I have to go, but I have a meeting at one. And uh, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Take okay. care. Bye. All right. Bye. Take care. Bye. Be well. Uh, okay. Our next speaker is Dr. Maria Antizari. And uh, Dr. Antizari received her PhD from Tehran Medical University and continued as an associate research scientist and postdoctoral fellow at the Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research and St. John's University, respectively. She taught biology courses at Queens College and St. John's University before moving to LaGuardia Community College, where she, she is a professor of biology and associate director of the NIH Bridges Program. Currently, she serves as a chair of the Nat Natural Sciences Department. Her research is focused on cell death, oxidative stress and microphage dysfunction related to the expression of different pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines and uh, neuroinflammation. She has published several scientific papers and a book chapter. She mentored about 30 undergraduate and graduate students who have either published or presented their research projects at national, international and local conferences. Uh, welcome Dr. Antizari. Oh, thank you so much, Ron, for inviting me and also uh, the committee members, Dr. Fuentes and Sheffield. And thank you so much um, for um, the nice introduction uh, and explanation that Dr. Zakari gave us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so uh, my talk is going to be about uh, immunity. Um, but um, I, as my colleagues uh, know, uh, that this is a very complicated and complex process. Um, I try to make it very simple and summarize it because I thought that it would be better for our students to understand the concept of immunity. So um, I apologize my colleagues if uh, my presentation is very simplified. Um, but um, in terms of immunity, when we uh, encounter to any viruses or bacteria or pathogen, um, our immune system can fight with uh, those pathogens. Um, and um, usually we have um, two um, different responses for um, this uh, fighting with those pathogens. These responses are um, innate and acquired um, immunity. Innate immunity is um, what we um, were born with it, like um, the epithelial cells that we have in um, our body, like our skin or the epithelial tissue or the covering that we have inside of our respiratory system. Um, the cells that uh, we have in our immune system, like white blood cells that we have, um, so some of the um, antibodies and complement um, proteins that we have in our blood, all those are um, considered as innate immune system. So uh, for innate immune system, um, for the, the, the response of body would be general. It means that um, this uh, innate immune system gives the same response to every pathogens that come into our body. Uh, it's not specified, it's just general, like um, having fever, uh, that would be, or inflammation. Um, so that would be the responses for uh, innate immune system. So it's not specific uh, and it's general. But acquired uh, immunity is the immunity that um, is specific and there are specialized cells that can make antibody or they can make some chemicals against of specific antigens. Um, so um, that means that uh, this immunity is more specific towards the pathogens. Um, so here in this slide, you can see that um, in our bone marrow, we have some stem cells that these are the undifferentiated cells and these uh, stem cells, hematopoietic stem cells, they can give two uh, different cells, myeloid and lymphoid progenitor cells. 
And these myelinate progenitor cells, basically they make different types of our blood cells, like red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells. And all these cells could be considered as innate immunity. That means that we were born with these cells and um, even in the first day, um, our body can fight with pathogen if uh, something comes to our body. And um, for lymphoid progenitor cells, these cells, these stem cells make uh, some specific cells which are lymphocytes and we have different types of lymphocytes. Um, one of them is called natural killer cell or uh, lymphocyte, which uh, can be considered as one of the type of uh, innate immune system as well. But these two uh, kind of uh, lymphocytes, which are T and B lymphocytes, these are um, specific for adaptive um, uh, immunity, which later on they can make um, some specific antigens or chemicals against of infected cells or against of the pathogen. Um, when we talk about adaptive immunity, we can divide that immunity into two uh, different um, types. Uh, one of them is humoral immunity. Humoral immunity means that these cells can secrete some chemicals into bloodstream and through bloodstream, um, this uh, chemical, which are called antibody or immunoglobulins, uh, they can transfer and go to different parts of our body and then uh, they can fight with antigen. So therefore adaptive immunity uh, is a systemic response as well. It means that it's not local. It is chemicals can travel and go to the other parts of our body as well and fight with pathogens. But um, for cell mediation, <coughs> uh, in this case, um, there, there is a cell, there's a T lymphocyte, uh, that this cell can directly um, interact with infected cell like this, and it uh, can release some chemicals to uh, just uh, make pores in the cell wall of the, uh, of the infected cell and lyse the cell and kill the cell. Or they can make some cytokines, they can release some cytokines that those cytokines can again um, activate macrophages, which are one of the uh, immune cells. And then those macrophages can uh, remove um, the pathogen. So these are two different types of adaptive immunity, which are humoral and cell mediated. Uh, so here in this slide also, you can see that um, one of the cells, which is called antigen presenting cell, they can eat the pathogens and then concentrate them and then introduce them to uh, two different cells. Either they can introduce them to the cell, which is a cytotoxic T lymphocyte, and this cell can directly kill the infected cell, or they can introduce the uh, antigen to B lymphocyte cells that these cells can um, convert to plasma cells and they can secrete some antibody, these Y-shaped structures that you can see here. These are antibodies which are against of antigens. They can just surround the antigens and they don't um, let that antigen to um, reach and attach to the receptors on the surface of the cells. Therefore, in this way, they can remove the harm of pathogens. Um, so for these cells that I uh, talked about, um, T lymphocytes and um, for T lymphocytes, we have two uh, different types. One of them is uh, uh, CD4 and uh, the other one is CD8. Uh, for CD4, this cell is more towards uh, releasing of the antibody and makes um, make antibodies, but CD8 is the one that uh, is involved in um, cell-mediated uh, response. Uh, so when we say CD4 and CD8, these are differences on the glycoprotein that we have on the surface of the membrane of these cells. Um, another thing which is a specific for adaptive immunity 
is that um, at the end of this, when we have either uh, making antibody or kill the cell directly, after that also this immunity has capacity to uh, make some cells which are called memory cells. And these memory cells will remain for a longer time in our immune system. And for the second time, if our body will be encountered to um, the same antigens, then we already have those memory cells over there that they can attack to that um, pathogen or antigen faster than the first time because they don't need to go all through all the first steps. They are already there. They know that antigen and then they can attack to that. So those cells are called memory cells that uh, I'm sure that Dr. Gupta is uh, going to talk about that when uh, she talks about vaccine. Um, so as you can see here, um, we have um, two different um, paths for B cells, that it's the humoral immunity and then cytotoxic T cells, uh, which uh, basically this path related to CD8 um, lymphocytes and this path relates to CD4. Um, but Although I uh, talked about that two different immunity, innate and adaptive, and you saw that the mechanisms for um, um, acting these immunity is different, um, but they are very interconnected. It means that they um, all the time they have to communicate. These two types of immunities should communicate with each other and help each other to remove um, these um, pathogens. Because uh, innate immunity is very important to make some chemicals, especially interferon gamma, uh, to, um, to activate the adaptive immunity. If we, if we do not have a strong innate immune system, then those cells cannot activate the adaptive uh, immunity. So that's why Genetic is very important for people who get COVID. If they don't have, in terms of their genetics, they don't have a strong innate immunity, then they cannot um, activate their adaptive immunity, which is more important for removing COVID-19. Uh, or some, some of the epigenetics that uh, came up earlier, that can also boost uh, the um, the way the mechanisms that our innate immunity is working, like, um, like for example, sex hormones are important. Um, the level of um, uh, cytoplasm, the ATP in our cytoplasm is important. So all these things are important for responses that we have in our innate immunity and also adaptive immunity. Uh, so in this slide, as you can see, these two different types of immunity um, are connected. So um, all, always when we, we want to fight with pathogens um, as the same as COVID-19, the first immunity that comes into the picture is uh, innate immunity, and that takes between zero to um, 12 hours, but then because um, we need more time to make those specific cells for antigens, then uh, the adaptive immunity takes longer to uh, come into the picture. For example, from the first day to seventh day, um, we, we can have these T cells, CD8 cells or CD4 cells that they can act against of virus. So uh, in uh, here you see that when uh, virus comes into the body, the innate immune uh, response uh, starts to come in. And then after that, uh, that induces or uh, stimulates the adaptive immunity, which uh, are cytokine production, regulation of inflammation, killing of infected cells, induction of antibodies, all these things uh, will happen through CD8 and CD4 cells. And at the end, also, we have two different types of memory cells that they can make CD8 cells and CD4 uh, cells later on if we encounter to the virus again. And um, here is um, the um, uh, chart 
for that is a graph that you can see that how different types of cells come in at different times for um, fighting with this virus. Um, so this is the incubation period. Uh, before we um, show any symptoms, we have that virus uh, in our body. That's why that's the, uh, we don't show any symptoms, but we are a carrier for this virus. So that's why we need to uh, be very careful and making two weeks quarantine is because of that, because we, we don't know for the first seven days, we don't know if we have, um, uh, virus or not for some people. Um, and therefore, uh, after a while, after incubation, the symptom will um, show up like having fever. And also you can see that uh, making antibody like IgM or IgG antibody, they, they will start to um, have their peak uh, between uh, the first and second week. that for the second time, if we uh, encounter with the same virus, then um, we are going to have more of these or more ready of these IgG and also IgM is uh, coming to the picture faster than the first exposure to uh, that virus. So that would be uh, this response that you can see here is because of the memory cells. Um, so when we encounter to um, SARS, um, uh, COVID-2 uh, virus, um, then um, we, the infection could be divided into, into three stages. Um, stage one, which is asymptomatic asympt uh, incubation period, which I uh, showed you. And then a stage two is non-severe symptomatic period, which our innate immune system uh, came in stimulates uh, the um, adaptive immunity. But if there is something that um, this coordination won't happen well, or we don't have, as I said, we don't have uh, the strong innate immunity, then we are going to have more load of virus. Virus can um, duplicate and, and replicate itself in our cells much faster. And therefore, stage three would be severe respiratory symptom, uh, which we have lots of the virus in our cells. So as you can see here again, um, that would be the way that our cells um, would encounter with uh, cells and in innate immunity, which makes interferon gamma. If we don't have, for example, enough interferon gamma here, then, then we have more severe um, responses um, later on. So uh, these are the, um, the factors that can cause the more severe um, symptoms. For example, impaired immunity, immune evasion of SARS-CoV-2, or high uh, viral load. Um, and all these things uh, could um, cause the uh, cytokine release syndrome or whatever the, the, the um, uh, what Dr. Zachary also said about cytokine um, storm that uh, this cytokine storm uh, show, um, shows um, a very severe uh, symptom and also it causes uh, multi-organ failure. So uh, these are um, the effects that we can see in at, at the result of uh, infection with uh, COVID-19. Um, definitely uh, in patient, we uh, scientists saw that there are less lymphocytes. So lymphocytemia is uh, one of the effect of this virus. And then uh, we have T cell activation and lymphocyte dysfunction. Um, we have um, some abnormality in the number of the other uh, white blood cells. Um, we have lots of uh, releasing lots of uh, inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-6 and interleukin-1 and 10. Um, and also we have increasing the antibody. Um, so one of the... Um, 
consequence of lymphocytopenia is going to be the effect of uh, the, uh, is going to be microbiota infection and also um, increasing the uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, which um, causes by cytokine storm can cause um, malfunctioning of many of our organs, such as lungs, liver, kidney, and heart. Um, so as you can see here, um, virus uh, has different uh, proteins on its envelope um, and uh, this virus has to attach to some specific um, receptors which are called angio um, um, converting enzyme 2. Um, they attach to that so the the virus can attach to any um, epithelial cells that has this receptor, like eyes, like um, the wall of intestine, like um, where, where we, cells have these uh, receptors, they can attach to that. Uh, through uh, attaching to that receptor, then um, this virus can go in, replicate inside um, uh, of the cell, and then they can go out and then infect the other cells as well. So one of the uh, areas that we can work is that we can make some antibodies that do not let these um, uh, viruses uh, attach to the receptors uh, because this is the way that they attach to receptors and then they attach to the cell membrane and they go in through endocytosis. So by uh, making antibodies, we can um, we can just uh, inhibit in entrance of these cells to um, uh, these uh, viruses to cells. But as you can see here. Um, for uh, coronavirus, we have different types of proteins, like uh, the spike proteins, which uh, mostly uh, in patients with uh, COVID-19, they um, saw that antibodies are against of this spike protein. But at, at the same time, we have E protein M and N and six other proteins as well. Uh, so that's why um, in different patients, they saw that we have different levels of antibodies for um, these proteins. As Dr. Zakari said, um, if we want to have a good vaccine, then we need to think about all these different types of proteins. Or um, one of the reason that people get, again, uh, another infection with uh, this, maybe they have different levels of these antibodies in their um, uh, in their system. And also um, scientists recently um, saw that besides of um, ACE2 receptors, maybe another receptor would be involved. Um, and also they uh, saw that in elderly people, um, which are more prone to coronavirus, and they have um, less CD8, which is the um, cytotoxic immunity. Uh, so therefore, they uh, can see that besides of antibody, we need to have the cytotoxic immunity as well. And it's not just antibody, so that makes it a little bit complicated for um, any intervention that we want to stop this virus from infecting ourselves. Okay, thank you so much. I'm sorry I talked too fast and uh, hopefully I can answer these questions at the end. Thank you very much, Dr. Dazari. And uh, so uh, our next speaker is Dr. Rita Gupta. Dr. Gupta is an associate professor in the Department of Natural Sciences at LaGuardia Community College. She is a molecular biologist with over 15 years of experience in research on DNA repair mechanisms of mycobacteria. She routinely mentors students in laboratory research projects and is also the mentor of, Lagu of the LaGuardia STEM Club. She is here to address principles behind vaccine production for infectious diseases. Uh, welcome, Dr. Gupta. And, sorry, someone has their... Um, My office is on here, Student Affairs, which is next one. Deborah here. Galena, you have your mic on. That's what it is. <laughs> that's, what, that's what was the purpose of it. That's the title of it. Okay, I'm going to mute. <laughs> okay, I think we're okay now. Um, 
Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, welcome, Dr. Gupta. Thank you, Ron, and all the organizers uh, for inviting me today as well for this wonderful event. Um, and uh, I think I'll just share my screen now to begin talking about, you know, the topic that I have been, you know, invited for today. So I hope you all are seeing my slides here now and a very really good afternoon to all of you. Uh, so after this background information, you know, from the great first two talks, um, I would like to start my presentation here by uh, discussing with you what a vaccine is. So essentially, you know, a vaccine is a biological preparation which is derived from a pathogen but by itself, it's not infectious and it does not cause the disease, so it's safe. But when it is administered into the body, you know, either through injections or orally, then it can actually mount a primary immune response uh, that can help us to, uh, you know, seek protection from the disease that's caused, caused by that particular pathogen. Now, you know, most commonly these pathogens are either these deadly viruses or, you know, the pathogenic bacteria. And usually the vaccines uh, that are, you know, commercially available, they comprise of either the killed microorganism, the killed pathogen. So here, you know, pathogens are either uh, killed by using radiations or extreme heat or some harsh chemicals, and therefore they are not infectious, you know, so they can be introduced into the body and they're safe. Alternatively, vaccines, you know, from like the last hundred years or so, we also have a second form, which is called as live attenuated vaccines. So here, uh, you know, you use the live microorganism but uh, it's a very weakened form of that pathogen. So again, you know, when it is introduced into the body, it will not cause a disease or an infection, but it still expresses all its surface proteins, you know, like in this cartoon on the left here, you can see, you know, there are uh, those surface proteins that Dr. Zakari and Dr. Ntasari talked about, you know, uh, the envelope glycoproteins, which our immune system can see. So, you know, the antigens of the pathogen are still intact in live attenuated vaccines, and they have been the most successful, actually, in protecting us from a variety of diseases. Um, and, you know, in addition to this, in the last, like, 40, 60 years, uh, subunit vaccines have also become very popular. So, as the name suggests, you know, in a subunit vaccine, you do not have the whole microorganism. Instead, there is only a component or a subunit of the pathogen which is present. And usually it's the surface protein or a surface polysaccharide for some other bacterial pathogens that is used as the antigen. You know, that's something which our body first sees when the, uh, when the pathogen enters into the body. So, you know, these are some of the favorite uh, antigens, the surface molecules that are used, but, you know, the subunit itself cannot mount uh, a very good immune response. So along with these subunit antigens, something called as an adjuvant is also used. So adjuvants are, you know, they serve as danger signals. You know, these are usually aluminum salts and they can really help to trigger a strong immune response. So when these adjuvants are mixed with the pathogenic antigens, uh, we can have a very good vaccine formulation. And, you know, in terms of how a vaccine works, I was seeing in the chat, you know, people had questions on that. So a vaccine, uh, you know, the goal with a good vaccine is that it should be able to elicit a, nice, a very good adaptive immune response uh, that includes both the antibodies and T cells. So, you know, here that would lead uh, to the generation of immunological memory, which means, you know, after vaccination, let's say if the person has subsequent infection with the intact pathogen, then neutralizing antibodies will already be present that will help to block the infection because they will help to block the entry of the pathogen into the host cells. And uh, also T cells will be there. So, you know, if the pathogen gains entry into a few host cells, then T cells uh, will help to actually kill those infected cells and curtail the spread of infection. So essentially, you know, uh, the vaccines help to first uh, elicit a primary immune response that can uh, serve to provide some immunological memory. And, you know, if the person gets 
uh, exposure or challenge with a real pathogen later on uh, in life, then you know uh, a more rapid secondary immune response would be elicited, which will help to prevent the infection. So next, I want to talk about uh, you know the different types of vaccines that can be produced, and uh, you know we have already discussed in detail about the first three types. So I'll be focusing on the viral vaccines today more. And uh, you know, as we discuss, we have already been introduced today. The structure of the virus, you know, the genetic material is inside. Oops, and uh, there is a protein envelope on the outside, and then you have these surface glycoproteins. So you know, uh, we can either have inactivated viral vaccines, or uh, the dead viral vaccines, or attenuated, which are the weakened form of the virus that are not infectious anymore or we can have subunit vaccines. I think it's better if I you know, show you a content like this. So the subunit vaccines here again, you know, uh, the popular viral antigens are those uh, surface glycoproteins that are used. And you can see on the list here on the right hand side of the slide that actually these three modalities uh, are used to uh, generate infection, uh, generate vaccines for a variety of infections. Uh, but then besides that, in principle, you know, we can also make uh, vaccines uh, which work, uh, you know, uh, by a different mechanism. For example, you can have a viral vector vaccine where, uh, you know, animal viruses are used which do not cause infections in humans. But then in those animal viruses, by genetic engineering, you know, we can uh, play with their genetic material and let's say the human virus genes so can be incorporated. So the idea here is when the viral uh, vector vaccine enters the human cell, then, uh, you know, the human viral antigenic proteins will be expressed to trigger an immune response. Similarly, you know, there's an alternative approach where a vaccine can have a virus-like particle. So, you know, here the surface proteins of the virus can be packaged to form a virus-like particle but there is no genetic material inside. So, you know, when this kind of a vaccine is introduced into the body, it will not cause the disease because there is no genetic material, but yet our immune system will see the virus-like particle and the surface proteins. So an immune response can be triggered. Uh, then thirdly, you know, we also have these uh, nucleic acid vaccines. Uh, so, you know, we can have DNA vaccines where let's say if you have a circular molecule of DNA, in that uh, the viral genes can be cloned. So the idea here would be when this DNA enters the cell, then you know, our cells uh, could read the DNA and uh, uh, you know, the viral uh, genes would be decoded and viral proteins will be made to trigger the immune response. And particularly this year, you know, in terms of nucleic acid vaccines, um, RNA vaccines have actually gained a lot of prom uh, prominence with regard to COVID-19 because there are like multiple ongoing efforts to make an RNA vaccine. So here, you know, instead of the DNA, you would have the RNA inside, uh, let's say a lipid nanoparticle and the RNA molecule would be having the gene for the viral spike protein. So, you know, uh, actually in terms of, you know, coming up with a vaccine for COVID-19, all of these modalities are currently being, uh, you know, very rigorously being followed by different research teams across the world in different countries. Um, so, uh, but then, you know, uh, next I want to discuss about this whole process of vaccine development. Okay, so in principle, we know how a vaccine can be made, but what's the timeline of it? How early can we have a vaccine? So typically, you know, to make a vaccine, it can take anywhere from five to 15 years because you know, there are multiple stages. You know, the first stage is that of laboratory research where you know, the basic science on the uh, virus is studied. You know, what are the molecules of the virus, the antigens of the virus that should be incorporated in the vaccine? And then in terms of making the vaccine formulation, you know, along with those antigens, what adjuvants have, should be added? So if this, you know, the first two stages of the laboratory research usually takes minimum of two years, you know, when we see the history of how the vaccines were made in the past. But then once a vaccine formulation is ready, the next stage is uh, that of animal trials. So here, you know, studies are conducted 
on small animals like mice and guinea pigs uh, to test the safety of the vaccine and also how effective it is in terms of inducing an immune response. So once you know, the vaccine candidate is found to be safe and effective in animals, then you know, the human clinical trials begin, which uh, usually occur in three phases. So here in the first phase, uh, a small group of you know, individuals are taken. And uh, uh, again, here, you know, the vaccine would be ad administered sequentially. It's not that all of those 50 or maximum 100 people will be vaccinated at once, because we don't know how safe is the vaccine in humans. You, know, you don't want to make everybody sick at the same time. So phase one would, is usually you know, uh, uh, done with a lot of caution in mind and sequentially groups of like two, three people initially are first vaccinated and you know, they are observed and, and then the next people are vaccinated even in the small group. Whereas in phase two, you know, the, the vaccine uh, manufacturers would then you know, uh, uh, take a larger group of people, you know, typically some hundreds, but not more than 500 volunteers. And here the goal is, you know, along with safety, uh, you want to uh, determine the immunogenicity of the vaccine, you know, how good of immune responses the vaccine generates in, in different people, you know, what are the titers of those neutralizing antibodies that can block the infection. And, and then, you know, once promising results are obtained here, then in phase three clinical trials, thousands and tens of thousands of people are taken. So, here, you know, more epigenetic studies can be conducted because sometimes, you know, even people from different countries are, uh, are incorporated in our phase three clinical trial. And, and then, uh, you know, along with the efficacy of the vaccine, you know, how well it is working, even the side effects of the vaccine are also monitored. Uh, so here, along with vaccine, you know, uh, the, the efficacy of the vaccine is also determined in comparison to a placebo, like a, a dummy drug. So, you know, once a vaccine candidate can, has passed all these clinical trials, uh, it can then be licensed, you know, and it, uh, it obtains an approval from a regulatory body like FDA in US or EMA in, in Europe. Um, and after that, also, we have a sixth stage in, in this vaccine development, you know, because finally you have to uh, make, uh, produce the vaccine in large amounts, you know, so a large scale uh, manufacturing process will continue, which again takes at least six months. So overall, you know, uh, if we see, you know, uh, a vaccine can take anywhere from minimum five to 15 years, but then, you know, in, in this year, especially, you know, with uh, till now, uh, over a million deaths have happened uh, because of COVID-19 worldwide. So there is a dire need to make a vaccine as fast as possible. So this whole process of vaccine development has been fast tracked and thankfully, you know, uh, companies and research groups across the world are simultaneously working uh, to have a successful vaccine. So, um, you know, uh, I think many of us might already know, we have heard about the mRNA vaccine by this company Moderna, you know, uh, in the United States uh, that's being currently tested. But, you know, I thought it, it's good to discuss, you know, their astonishing timeline here, you know, the sequence of the uh, COVID-19 virus uh, became available in January. But then this company, you know, within a month in February, they had their vaccine formulation ready where the mRNA actually encodes for the spike protein of the uh, COVID-19 virus. And, uh, you know, in, in March, then they actually began their phase one clinical trials and they got some, you know, promising results. So they proceeded with phase two trial in May. And currently starting in, in July, you know, the phase three clinical trials are still ongoing. So, uh, you know, besides that, there are actually some 195 uh, vaccine candidates that are being currently tested in different stages of development. Um, but something nice that, you know, I, I want to discuss with you all today is that besides Moderna's mRNA vaccine, there are vaccine candidates by these other research teams also uh, that are in phase three clinical trials. And I believe this is good because it's not guaranteed which vaccine candidate will ultimately work? You know, because number one, safety is of paramount importance. You know, we don't want to take a vaccine which is not safe for different ethnic groups, uh, and then it should be efficacious. So I guess we all have to very patiently work for the, I mean, wait for the 
results of these phase three clinical trials by the different teams. Um, and hopefully we'll have a vaccine soon then. <laughs> so yeah, I would like to end my you know, brief presentation here and uh, I would love to take the questions. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Gupta. And uh, everyone can feel free to start entering questions for both Dr. Intazari and Dr. Gupta in the chat. And we'll go on now to our next speaker, Dr. Lucia Fuentes. Uh, Dr. Fuentes received her PhD in molecular biology from the University of British Columbia. And she did her postdoctoral work in plant virology at the Agricultural Canada Research Station in Vancouver, Canada. At LaGuardia, Dr. Fuentes does research on the mechanisms of Im immunomodulation in, mi in microglia in neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Fuentes has always seen the study of science as a gateway for students to widen their understanding of not only the natural world, but of our society as a whole. And uh, Dr. Uh, Fuentes is going to speak about uh, the role of the anti-vax movement, as well as herd immunity. Welcome, Dr. Fuentes. Um, okay, can everybody see the screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, well, um, I guess as one of the organizers, I just want to thank everybody uh, for coming to, to this uh, town hall and, uh, and obviously thank other panelists as well. Um, and uh, so today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, a little bit uh, on the side, but uh, that very, I think, important for us to consider, given what is going on right now with the, uh, the vaccine production and what uh, uh, Dr. Gupta and Dr. Desari um, talked about in terms of how vaccines are made and the immune system, et cetera. And so, um, so I'm going to talk about the role of the anti-vax movement, especially in the light of the development of vaccines and uh, the role of the anti-vax movement more in terms of how this movement has actually uh, caused some problems in terms of the uh, control of uh, infectious diseases through vaccination. Um, so the uh, first of all, what is the anti-vax movement? Maybe a lot of you might be familiar with it, but in general, the like core anti-vaxxers are people who refuse to be vaccinated or to get their children vaccinated. So as I, when I say core uh, anti-vax movement, um, this is a very small group of people presently. It's about maybe 2% of the population in the US. Uh, but this goes actually back, this anti-vax movement goes back to the 1800s. When vaccines were first developed, uh, there was a especially religious movement that was against uh, the vaccination. They saw it as something unnatural. And uh, also there was another uh, group of people that also uh, felt that it was very unsafe. Um, and so, as I said, it goes back to the 1800s. Um, what changed uh, the anti-vax movement and really brought it down in terms of following uh, was the Vaccination Act in 1853, which made uh, vaccination mandatory um, and for infants. Now, a lot of things have happened in between uh, and the movement has had its ups and downs, but uh, what really was a horrific blow to vaccination and uh, basically saw a resurgence of the anti-vax movement was a publication in 1998 by Dr. Wakefield uh, where he published a paper claiming that 
there was actually a direct connection between uh, MMR vaccine, so measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, and autism. And you're probably all familiar with this paper because unfortunately it was very, it was given a lot of press, uh, widespread uh, interviews with uh, Wakefield. It turned out that he had a huge conflict of interest with the pharmaceutical company uh, and the study was found to be completely fraudulent. The paper was retracted. Uh, since then, there have been a series of studies uh, involving actually millions of children uh, showing uh, definitively that vaccines do not cause autism and that vaccines do not cause encephalitis, two of the most commonly sort of advertised effects or side effects of vaccines. So these, the, all these uh, ideas have been refuted, but in spite of that, the anti-vax movement has actually really uh, had uh, some uh, deleterious effects in terms of particularly resurgence of infectious diseases. One example is the measles. Uh, so the measles was in the year 2000, the measles in US uh, was said to be eliminated, not eradicated, but eliminated. Uh, and so uh, as you can see in this graph, in from 2010 to 2019, the number of measles outbreaks has, has really increased. And this has increased due to lack of vaccination. So it's a direct effect of the anti-vax movement. Um, measles is a disease that can cause uh, very serious uh, effects on health. Um, and uh, so this is a concern. And it's a concern especially because the whole reason that we have vaccination is because on um, this, you might have heard the concept of herd immunity. So the principles behind vaccination are that normally, if you have a population, so all these people that are here, uh, these figures that are in blue, these are people who are not immunized, but they're healthy. And then the sick people are the people in red. So when you have an infectious disease and you have a population that is not immune, that has not been immunized against that disease, so sort of the situation we had with COVID. What happens is that there's a very high rate of uh, infectivity and a large portion of the population uh, gets infected and the disease spreads throughout. If you have a few individuals in the population that are immune, whether it's through vaccination or because they had the disease, and this is sort of our present situation in some respects, a great majority of people, the vast majority of people are not immune because they have not got the disease. And so what happens in this situation is again, there is a spread of the disease throughout the same population, as you can see, very similar to uh, the, the previous scenario. Now, so what happens uh, when the population is immunized? So when the population receives the majority of the population, and it depends on the virus, it depends on the infectious agent, on what uh, percentage of the population needs to be uh, vaccinated. But when a large proportion of the population is immunized, then this is what you consider herd immunity, because being immunized protects other individuals that may not be able to receive the vaccine or that may just not respond to the vaccine. So for example, maybe you've heard that in the case of COVID, um, people have talked about vaccines and how the elderly uh, will not really benefit from a vaccine. And that's in general, a lot of times uh, older people don't have such a strong immune system. Now, if everybody else in the population is vaccinated, then the chances of the susceptible or elderly people being in contact with an infected person are much, much lower. lower. And this is what we refer to as herd immunity. And again, it changes depending on the infectious agent, how much of the population needs to be um, immunized. In general, it varies between 80 and 90 percent. 
Um, so the idea that we will achieve herd immunity by just everybody getting sick is totally outrageous. This would mean that millions of people would die in that process. So I just want to clarify that. And that is why we need the vaccine because we don't want millions of people dying, getting the disease and dying and then achieving herd immunity. Um, so one of the things that is important to, to realize is that uh, in immunizations, according to the World uh, Health Organization, can prevent or prevent two to three million deaths per year. And if a higher rate of uh, vaccination was achieved, it could even go up to uh, three to four million people uh, not dying because of the vaccination process. So going back to the anti-vaccine or anti-vax movement, one of the things, again, we have to emphasize that the anti-vax movement, there's a core group of people that are uh, embedded in that movement and will not change their mind. But one of the things that is important is to actually examine this movement and how it operates. There are, one of the things about it is that the anti-vax people um, are basically have different arguments. They're not a, a homogeneous group. So the people who are pro-vaccines tend to have a very clear idea that vaccines work. So it's pretty homogeneous. But people that are anti-vaccine usually can be grouped, and this is a, a series of papers have come out and people have been able to group the anti-vax um, movement into sort of four different sort of subgroups, depending on their arguments. One of the arguments that the anti-vax movement people have is uh, lack of trust, is based on lack of trust. And so uh, the, there's the idea that government and big pharma are in cahoots and are making money and they're selling vaccines just to make money. Uh, not to protect the people. So there, again, it's a lack of st uh, trust in, in the institutions that normally would take care of the, of the health of the population. Uh, another common uh, group uh, or uh, explanation or uh, <coughs> argument the, for anti-vaxxers is that the vaccines are unnatural and there are natural alternatives to vaccines. So for example, the vaccine for HPV, when you go into these, these cohorts of people or groups of people, uh, what you find is that they'll say, oh, instead of taking, getting the HPV vaccine, uh, you can just eat yogurt and that will prevent you from getting HPV. So um, another aspect, another group uh, is concerned about safety. Uh, and uh, in this case, they talk about uh, side effects, they concentrate on side effects. Um, and usually what happens in these cases is that they take single cases uh, and then generalize uh, those side effects. Um, and finally, the last one is people who believe that vaccines are really kind of part of a conspiracy and that that conspiracy is to basically bring down the population and eliminate certain types of people. So one of the things is that this uh, anti-vax movement has become the focus of many uh, epidemiologists and scientists. In fact, uh, just this year in May, there was a paper in Nature that actually looked at how, why, the, the question was, how come this anti-vax movement is growing so much? It's actually it's a small group of people, and yet the influence that they're having on undecided people, or un, yeah, and undecided groups is huge. And they're growing because their influence on those undecided uh, people. And so what these people uh, in this paper did was that they realized that they took uh, uh, I think it was a uh, hundred, no, they took a million different samples from Facebook. And what they did was group them into these different groups, anti-vax, which you can see in red, undecided in green, and then pro-vax in blue. And what they saw was that the clusters 
of the anti-vax groups were very, they were small, the groups were small, but the amount of influence that they had on the undecided was huge. And part of the reason that the, the analysis, at least that they, that they made, what they saw was that in fact, the anti-vax, because they had different anti-vax arguments, could actually appeal to different people uh, in the undecided group. Now, this is important for us, for all of us, students of science, and or those of us who do research in science. It's very, very important for us to understand how these things operate. Uh, we can't just dismiss the anti-vax uh, movement as, as like, oh, these people don't know anything. We need to think about how they operate and what we can do in order to bring light, and especially particularly for those who are undecided. So one of the things is that it's not just about misinformation, and that has to be very clear. So one of the things is that we need to understand is that a lot of people who hesitate in terms of whether to get vaccinated or not, they actually have serious concerns because there's just so much information and so much misinformation that's going around. So for us, again, our responsibility is to, first of all, emphasize, first of all, respect those people who are in, in doubting uh, and try and actually contribute in some way to an understanding and for them to actually think about, rethink, their position. One of the things that's important is that we have to emphasize scientific consensus. Most of the scientists, like 90% and 90 of doctors actually recommend their patients take you know, have the vaccines. Um, vaccine and the, the most, the scientific consensus is that vac vaccines are safe and that definitely they reduce the incidence of um, disease. Uh, what another thing to do is to provide examples. So here, this is an example that you can see on the screen. So in the 1900s, so in the late 1800s and early 1900s, this is these are the profiles of the, the circles represent the numbers of uh, people with the orange one here. You can see the measles, pertussis, pertussis, which is a very severe and lethal uh, disease. Uh, rubella, mumps, uh, haemophilus influenza, diphtheria. And so what you can see is that in 2010, so this was before the measles outbreak started uh, climbing, but you can see the reduction in the number of cases. This has also resulted in a huge reduction in deaths, so in mortality. So finally, one thing that one I, I, I'd uh, ask you to remember uh, and to become uh, ambassadors of uh, people understanding vaccines, going to social media. You're, a lot of young people use social media. We need, to, we need to go there. We need to spread information, but information that's uh, scientifically um, sound uh, and that is based on uh, peer-reviewed literature. Um, and one thing to remember is that not all people who don't vaccinate are anti-vaxxers. Um, the other thing is that our brains, usually what we do is we tend to, if we see something that is in sync with what we already believe, that's what we'll go for. We have this bias. So instead of opposing, we need to uh, try and involve a person in a dialogue to understand where they're coming from. Stress the consensus, stress the positive aspects of the vaccination. Very important is that the vaccinations actually contribute to the health of everyone in society. And this is, again, it's positive messaging. When you feel, and particularly under the circumstances we are now, a lot of people are lonely, uh, we need to, act, to access groups, so part of what is being seen is that people are just going wherever they can to find answers. So we need to be there to, to get those answers. We need there to give the proper information uh, and positive messaging is part of that. Uh, the fact that you can contribute 
to the health of your society just by getting a vaccine is that gives people a sense of, of community and that's important. The other thing is provide information. Don't just judge, just provide information that's reliable. People can think and make up their minds based on that information. A lot of times what's missing is the information. So that those are important things. And finally, the vaccinations involve a lot of aspects. And I think we've seen part of, of this. It's, it's a huge uh, series of different aspects that need to be considered. And this involves all kinds of uh, organizations, uh, the healthcare provider, the parents, regulators, government offices, and uh, all this is part of the puzzle. And we need to actually ensure that there is, um, that, that there's a clear understanding of everything that's involved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucia. And now on to our final speaker, Hugo Fernandez. Hugo Fernandez is a professor of fine art photography and art appreciation in the humanities department of LaGuardia Community College. He is also the host of What's Going On, a weekly radio show on WLGR, LaGuardia Web Radio. Welcome, Hugo. Thanks, and uh, I got a hard, uh, I got a hard, deadline, which is I have to leave. I have a meeting at two, so I'm going to cause a lot of trouble and then I'm going to probably leave. Okay. So, uh, and of course now my computer's going slow. So, uh, I put these two pictures on here, not because I'm an egomaniac, uh, though I am, uh, but just to kind of show you on the left was a picture about seven years ago, which is the, which is the person I wish I was, you know, considerably thinner. And on the right is the reality and uh, seven years later and probably 20, 20, 30 pounds heavier. So, and you'll see how that applies uh, in what I'm talking about. I kind of feel funny because I'm coming after uh, Dr. Fuentes and someone, I don't know whether she stole my thunder or whether she's going to basically make a case for why you probably should not listen to me. Because the first thing you should know is that I am not a doctor. Uh, like I said, I have an MFA. Uh, I know about photography, I know about art, so you must ask the question, well, why am I here? Well, I do run, I do uh, this radio show, and uh, some people say about, uh, you know, people in the news, like we're, you know, we're paid to learn uh, publicly, and though I'm not really paid to do the radio show, I do learn a lot, and uh, being invited for this, I had to, of course, do my homework, which, you know, I wish I could have done more, but uh this will be the best. So the, first, so the second thing I want to say is also that I get in a lot of arguments with my, uh, uh, the faculty from uh, philosophy about this, the thing of morals versus ethics, which I'm told is the same thing, but I don't necessarily agree. So for example, as an artist, uh, I always say that I'm amoral as a rule, which means, you know, and I found that a lot of times when people start taking on other people's morals, it really gets in the way of creativity. So I don't really like that idea of having to answer to people's moral codes. But as a professional, I have to follow ethical codes as far as behavior, uh, the way I treat students, the way I, I treat uh, colleagues, the way I behave at the college. So I do believe in ethical codes if you know, I want to. And, I do, and also in the arts, there are obviously ethical codes in, in, for the professional aspect of it. Uh, but if I was going to say, if I had to have one moral belief, it is this one, which is if I can save your life, I am obliged to, uh, you know, there are, there, people would say, you know, it's the kind of the thing you see somebody falling off a cliff and uh, you grab them and now you feel yourself going over. What do you do? And my belief is if I were to let go, I, there's the part of me that dies with that person. And uh, so again, you'll see how this kind of applies to uh, what I'm trying to talk about, which is the et the ethical aspects of things. Now I'm finding that I can't forward. Okay, so let's talk about the complications of things here with vaccines, trials, and ethics. So in order to test the vaccine, you, you have to be willing to be exposed to COVID-19. I mean, that's the only way they can see if it works, right? They give you the vaccine, and then they expose you to this disease, right? Uh, so you're, you go into this with the understanding that you may or may not 
receive the placebo, right? Which is the dosage, which is not the act. They have to give both the dosage of the vaccine that they believe will work. And then another test group of people are, are getting, you know, I don't know what they're getting, uh, glucose or something. So do, having done this, this means that you could get, you, you know, they, they're going to definitely expose you to the illness, right? Uh, and as, su as such, you could get very sick, uh, or I'm saying exposed to COVID-19, you could get ill, you could die, uh, and you could also have long lasting complications. Uh, you know, so what's interesting is that, you know, obviously there are many trials running uh, and just uh, I was looking at numbers for like six trials, they need about 210,000 people, but they only have 17,000 people. So this is really problematic, you know, uh, but what's interesting is that, you know, classically vaccines are created after a cure has been found. So what's really problematic is that there is no, currently there is no anything that anybody would call a cure for COVID-19. So I go back to this previous issue of you're being exposed. You don't really know what's going to happen. Uh, so the, so my question is, you know, would you do it? You know, if you were, uh, you know, are you prepared to, to take these chances, you know, on behalf of whoever humanity? Well, there are a lot of communities that have grounds for mistrust of the medical community or, you know, in general, I mean, Dr. Fuentes was talking about the anti-vax movement, but, you know, again, we have to understand. So in the African-American community, uh, you know, the Tuskegee Institute syphilis studies where they were giving, you know, black men syphilis uh, without telling them, right? Or those of you who know, we had a common reader at the college, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, who went to uh, Johns Hopkins University uh, Hospital, and they, you know, they took parts of her uh, cancer cells and have been reproducing them for testing for years without ever telling her, making, you know, billions of dollars on this. And in fact, they're actually using the Hella cells right now for these tests. So uh, the Jewish community, right? Uh, what happened in World War II, as far as, you know, Nazis doing, ex you know, experiments on people in the camps, uh, that can't be forgotten. Uh, not to mention what the Japanese also did, uh, you know, in the, in the war during those same years. The incarcerated community has a history of being exposed to medical testing that was or was not ethical. And as a result, there's a lot of rules uh, against doing tests in prisons anymore. And it's very hard to do it at all. Uh, the name, even the Native American community, you know, there, there, you know, uh, there are cases where, you know, th uh, they were handing out, uh, you know, blankets uh, that infected with smallpox uh, to understand, you know, Native Americans had no immunity to, to European diseases, and 90% of them were wiped out uh, by that alone, uh, on top of forced labor, uh, being, you know, being moved, and uh, being, you know, uh, the, the treatment on reservations, as well as war. Uh, and then there, you know, Dr. Fuentes has also mentioned the conspiracy theorists. All right, so uh, my, my favorite is uh, Project MK Ultra, where the CIA was giving people, uh, you know, LSD and not telling them, and may have to actually, you know, unwittingly started the uh, the psychedelic movement. You know, so uh, you know there there's cause. So here's the what I call the conundrum, right? The, the, which makes it really complicated is. The disease currently is disproportionately affecting people of color. And by the way, you know, uh, also affecting the underdeveloped countries, which take issue with testing as well. The Orthodox religious communities, they're, they engage with the general population and may be subject to the general society expectations of utilizing public resources, such as the school system, for example. Uh, Dr. Fuentes talked a little bit uh, about that before. The prison population, again, is disproportionately suffering. You know, again, they're inside uh, and they have substandard health care. But and what's even worse is that technically they're not even entitled to vaccines if we develop them, which is uh, the probably the cruelest joke of all. So uh, most communities suffer from less than sufficient medical care. So uh, Again, this really brings into question is like, here now we find ourselves that we have to work together as a community. I'm talking about a global community. But we also have to face the fact that healthcare is not universal. So we're asking people who can't even go to the doctor to participate in these, in these studies. 
or participate in the cure, uh, you know, for people who have Aetna plans, right? And that just doesn't, you know, it doesn't align. So it, it, it could be an interesting, it actually could be a moment where we finally have to realize that we cannot no longer uh, ignore uh, the fact that everybody needs decent health care uh, for, for no other purpose for the herd, right? So they, I have looked also into the financial aspects of this. I actually watched a great uh, webinar for, that was at Baruch. So again, the question becomes who is picking up the cost and who is entitled to the profit? Uh, the government is funding, uh, helping fund a lot of these studies. Some are doing it basically for you know, goodwill, but then you know, are they allowed to make money off of this? Uh, the government is actually you know, contractually working with them to say, well, you can only make this much. We're gonna only pay this much for these uh, if it is discovered, right? But what about if if we're not the first ones to come up with a vaccine? The United States has actually kind of been doing this on its own while other countries are working together or working on their own. So what happened if, for example, the Chinese come up with this and they want to affect our trade talks or the Russians come up with it and they're not happy about who we elect for president? So it, it becomes, you know, this is the, or we, for whatever reasons, want to withhold. Not to mention, if you develop the vaccine first, do you want to make your country benefit from its, uh, you know, uh, discovery and take care of your people first before you take care of anybody else? Uh, so again, who gets that first recommended dose? Even within our own country, there have been, I think Dr. Fauci talked about, you know, the first amount that might be produced is about a million doses. And then like a year after that or so, I mean, you know, maybe we could have a hundred million. So we have eight million, eight billion people on the planet. I mean, you can, you can see the problem here, you know, who and who decides? So they left off that question mark, but who who decides who gets those doses, the, who gets taken care of first. So I use this analogy here, uh, you know, waiting for the vaccine could be tantamount to waiting to be rescued from the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. If the, any, if I have any Jaws fans out there, uh, you remember this scene where he talks about the, you know, the ship goes down in the water, they're being, a, they're being eaten by sharks one at a time, and they're waiting for the rescue plane to get them out of the water, uh, you know, until you're out of the water, you're not safe. So it really, uh, you know, the, the, this vaccine question and all of the issues that are involved with it are, we could, we could panic or we can look at it as an opportunity and say, what the way we have built our healthcare system up to this point globally may not serve us moving forward. It's really an opportunity because we all are gonna pay for uh, for for this disease if we can't get a handle on it uh, as we already have been. I'm sure many of you, particularly students are, are struggling as a result of this. Uh, Long-term effects, uh, possible post-vaccine side effects. So again, we don't know if, if that's gonna happen. And, and in fact, funds, uh, they've been talking about creating a fund because so you're a company developing a vaccine, now you're getting sued because that vaccine is you know, causing side effects, uh, who pays for that again? So there, there's the notion of this National Vaccine Injury Compensation Fund. Uh, the good news is, uh, particularly for in the, uh, this, and this came from a business professor, is the new generations of students see more interested in ethical concerns of business if, if faculty can humanize that problem. Uh, so, you know, it's hard to think in the abstract of the 8 billion, but if you're thinking, so for example, in my case, I have a, I have a daughter in her early 20s. I want her not to die of COVID. That may be enough for me uh, to participate, right? Uh, and I think that that's what, one of the things we need to do, we need to, but you know, there are plenty of communities that do not understand why they're being asked to save the lives of people that did not care about them financially or healthcare wise before this thing happened. And the third, you know, the, the developing countries as well, why are they going to participate in order to save, you know, the, the uh, economically advanced companies, countries. So uh, it's really been, it's a, it's a teachable moment, as we say, in uh, education. I got a bunch of resources that I uh, went through. And by the way, I just put, I put this all together. I didn't realize we, I thought we were going to have a much more casual conversation. 
So, uh, and I used my APA style, but uh, that's what I had to share. So, okay. I hope I stopped sharing, sorry. Do it that way. So again, like I said, I apologize. I, I'm already late for my meeting. Thank you very much, Hugo. And actually, the apology, I guess, is in the it is mine. And uh, because we should have had um, more time for question and answers, but there was just so much information. Uh, I hope the audience found uh, all of this useful. This is only the first part of an ongoing discussion uh, related to COVID-19. We will be having several more of these sessions. Uh, for those who would like to stay on for a little bit of Q&A, I think we still have Dr. Gupta, Dr. Fuentes uh, with us, um, and uh, Dr. Sheffield Ron, is with us. Ron, Dr. Yes. Gupta left, I think. She oh, left. she did, okay. Yeah, unfortunately we are at two o'clock and I think we will probably have to stop here. Um, Dr. Fuentes, are you with us? She's still here. Yeah, She's I'm here. Still here. Okay. Um, and Leo, are you here? Maybe not. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, thank you, everyone. And maybe just if uh, Dr. Fuentes, Dr. Sheffield, and I just stay on for uh, uh, one or two minutes just to sort of um, tie things up. This. Uh, entire presentation will be on the CRISP website by the end of, say, next week. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ron, for moderating. Dr. Yeah. Nerio, we all appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ron, for sure. Thank you. <laughs> and maybe we could also post some of the uh, resources. The yes, absolutely. The resources, yeah. for sure. I, I just uh, posted a link to the plan for the World Health Organization for the distribution of the vaccines. Okay. Uh, which is not the plan that the US has, but it's the, the rest of the world. So. so do you have a few minutes? Maybe the people who are still on, you know, I, I, the unfortunate part is we did have a lot of questions. We didn't get a chance to get those answered, but um, do we have time for just a quick conversation? Uh, would you, would you like to do that? Okay. Uh, would anybody like to pose questions for Dr. Fuentes? And let's see, we may have... Um... I think unfortunately many of the people who submitted questions have already left. Yeah. Let's see. Well, this is an interesting one. I wonder if you would be able to speak to this one. Um, if a vaccine isn't at least 85% effective, why the necessity? If many people will already have antibodies, why would they need the vaccine? With Gardasil, most of the population was already exposed to HPV. So anyone from 2009 going forward received the vaccine, but not anyone prior to that year since there was huge exposure already. So what about everyone else prior that cannot get the vaccine? Will it be for the, sa the same for the COVID vaccine? Will there be a date cutoff for anyone who can take the vaccine? Okay, so let me address the HPV issue because um, it is true that HPV is uh, it's highly contagious. Uh, it's a sexually transmitted virus. Uh, and, uh, and this is why usually uh, it's recommended that uh, 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 females actually, and I think now they also recommend for males get uh, inoculated before puberty. Um, the HPV, uh, this, this virus uh, is not a virus that it causes immediate disease like in the case of COVID. Uh, it's a virus that has been clearly associated with, uh, with cancer. Uh, and so it, um, the studies for, for years and years and years, uh, a lot of studies ended up showing that, yeah, that HPV definitely was correlated. So it's a, it's a longer term effect. It's not an immediate effect. And in that sense, 
it's different than the situation we face now with COVID. And so SARS-2 is a completely different virus. It's a new virus. We've never been exposed to this virus. So nobody in the world had defenses against this virus, um, which is different than HPV. So it, when you have a, and even if you even if you look at the United States that has the worst case scenario in terms of the number of people infected, it's nothing in proportion to the number of people that are not infected. So even in the places where the cases are going up like crazy, there will not be, you cannot achieve herd immunity in that manner. Uh, you, I mean, in some respects, some people are, and, and I've never heard it, I've never seen any official document or anything uh, stating that the policy of the government is to just let people get infected and achieve herd immunity in that manner. Um, there have been people who have basically come out and said, uh, allow opening everything and allowing for people to just, you know, keep on doing what they did before COVID is basically uh, going to cause, you know, millions of people to be infected and millions of people in the US would die. Uh, so we cannot achieve herd immunity. I, I'm not sure if that's exactly the question. In other words, the vaccine for, for COVID is going to be for the great majority of the population that has not been infected. The people who have already been infected, they could receive the vaccine. Vaccines vary in terms of how long they confer immunity. So in some cases, you have vaccines that are lifelong vaccines. Um, and I believe MMR is one of those that you, you have memory cells that last your entire life. Sometimes you have to get a boost, a booster shot, but in general, uh, but then there are vaccines like the flu vaccine that also because of the variation in the flu virus, that only lasts for a year. So there are other vaccines for other coronaviruses which have been tried in the past more as experimental because the other coronaviruses are ca cause colds and so there hasn't been a huge development of vaccines. But in those cases, a lot of those vaccines have uh, uh, maybe a couple of years, last for a couple of years, after which uh, you lose that immunity. The, the, there seems to be a loss in the memory cells. So you have to give a boost. So in a lot of cases, like for example, with um, hepatitis B vaccine or hepatitis C vaccines, or even with uh, meningitis vaccines, they give you a boost in grade 12. I don't know if here they do that, but I know in Canada and other places, that's what they do. And then after that, you will be immune. So the, the vaccines vary, the number of, uh, the way your immune system responds varies. Um, whether you, the vaccine is based on mostly an immunoglobulin response as opposed to the T cell response that Professor and Dr. Tazari spoke about uh, depends again on the virus. So there are a lot of other uh, issues that are in play and that in fact, even the people who are studying the vaccines or, or working on these vaccines know that it's complicated, know that it, it's less, not an ordinary vaccine. So for example, somebody says, how is it that some people test negative for COVID but positive for antibodies? Well, if you already had COVID, the virus will no longer be in your, if you had COVID, let's say two months ago, yeah, uh, the virus and you recovered and you're fully recovered, when you go and take the test for COVID, the virus will no longer be there, and so you will test negative. On the other hand, because you got COVID, your immune system will have developed antibodies, and so you will test positive for the antibodies and negative for the virus. And that happens usually about two months after you got the disease. That's sort of the uh, the time where you don't get false positives um, because uh, if you ever had the virus, there are remnants, little pieces of RNA that remain sometimes, even though you don't have an active infection, there's still some pieces of RNA. And because of the technique, the PCR involves 
just amplifying, making a million gazillion copies of that little RNA that's very specific. It's only from the virus. If you test positive, apart from if, if the test is accurate, which the, most of the PCR tests are, if you test positive, that means that there was a fragment of viral RNA because you don't have that RNA in any of your cells unless you have tested positive for the virus. I'm not sure if I answered this question. <laughs> I think so. Along those lines, uh, do you see this question from Edward Molina in, uh, I don't know if it shows on your screen in the same way, right? Regarding natural and acquired immunization, if an individual contracts COVID-19 and they manage to survive, mm -hmm. is it possible that they become naturally Im immune? And if so, if the individual receives the vaccine, can this vaccination lead to serious illness or possible death for the individual? Um, well, the first part is, yeah, if you, uh, for most, I mean, again, a lot of the information is premature from, you know, even though I've read a lot of papers, there's not a full uh, understanding of uh, how immunity works because, in, but in general, uh, if you have had COVID, you, as I said before, you will have mounted an immune response and both with the T cells and basically with the B cells. So you're gonna have antibodies and the specific T cells that will also attack the virus. Um, that's in general. The, what the tests they do for the antibodies are for the circulating antibodies. So yes, you will be, you will have antibodies already. If you get vaccinated, the vaccine is not a live, virus that will replicate in your body and cause disease. So in a sense, if you get vaccinated when you already have antibodies, uh, you may have a reaction that is stronger than if you haven't had the disease because you have antibodies. So you're gonna respond to, to whatever they inject. But because they're inoculating you with something that is not dividing and, and invading your cells in the same manner, then it will not cause the disease. It would be like, it's the same thing as if you actually had somebody, you know, cough on you who had the virus, you're not gonna get the disease because your immune system is gonna block it. So it would be the same. Your immune system would, uh, would neutralize the antigens that they've given you uh, because you already have antibodies. So does that make sense? Yes, uh, there's a question here. Um, it's, it's really a comment, but I guess we could turn it into a question. My daughter almost died from the DPT shot, and then I started reading and educating myself. Um, do you have any perspective on that? Uh, are there dangers to the DPT shot? So uh, most vaccines, the, 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 no vaccine is 100% safe. You can't say something is 100% safe. It's like any medical intervention. Uh, there's never, you know, total, uh, there's never no risk. The risk, but the, the, the amount of risk is usually uh, very, very low. The accepted, the, in order to be able to, um, get approval from the FDA or the CDC or, who, or any regulatory body. Uh, the, obviously, there has to be this phase one, phase two, phase three, and part of phase three is precisely uh, looking at the risks because there's always going to be a risk. In general, what happens with any vaccine, most vaccines will cause you to get a bit of a fever, uh, maybe a bit of muscle aches and things, uh, and that usually will last one or two days. Um, and so those are the side effects. But in very rare cases, some like something like the MMR vaccine, uh, in like maybe one in, I think it's one in 10,000 cases, uh, due to the fever, the child might get a seizure, which will pass after 
the fever comes down. And I think it's like more like one in a hundred thousand cases. And then there are cases, uh, and this is like one in 500,000 cases where a child might develop further seizures. Um, so there are risks, but the risks are extremely low when you compare the risks of a child actually getting measles, being sick with measles and, and dying, which, uh, so the risks, the risk of a child getting measles and dying is higher than the risk of a child getting a vaccine and getting, uh, and it usually has to be like at least a uh, hundred, if not a thousand times uh, less risky in a sense. So there is a protocol and there are uh, uh, regu uh, regulations. One thing that is very, very important is that many times, uh, and I'm not saying this is the case in, in, in this case, but many times the age of vaccination is also an age where children tend to get sick of other illnesses. And so this is why it's important, if, even if you study, for example, BPT, to look at studies that, are, um, that involve massive amounts of children to ensure that the, the correlation is not causation. So for example, even with, if you go and read all of the, this MMR and autism, some people will say, oh, well, I, you know, my child got the MMR vaccine and then six months later, uh, they were autistic. Well, it turns out when you look at the time of vaccination for MMR and the time where the first uh, sort of, I guess, behaviors the, the, in the spectrum of autism uh, start showing is basically within six months of the vaccination. So there's this that's why these studies with, with a million children are very important because they're, they, it's, there's, you know, it's very, very clear that even though there may be a slight correlation, there's no causation uh, because the rate of development of autism in children that are not vaccinated is the same or even higher than the children that are vaccinated. So there's, there's no causation. Uh, in the case of Again, I can't say for this particular case in DPT, but um, it could be a case where the child became sick for another reason. Uh, and this is not an uncommon thing. And of course, as a parent, I would, I would think, oh my goodness, I just gave him the vaccine. So in that this is part of why we really need to, um, and, and when you go to the literature, you go to the literature not looking for the response you want to find, but really trying to get a spectrum of the literature, the peer-reviewed literature, that is. The World Health Organization is a good place to start. They have excellent resources, excellent resources. Uh, uh, it's, uh, and it's all obviously peer-reviewed, so I would recommend if you have questions on COVID, they have fantastic courses on COVID, they have fantastic courses on vaccines, and they have a ton of information on, uh, you know, side effects and, you know, uh, and anything you need to know about vaccines. So. Okay, uh, so I, maybe we should end it here. Um, thank you so much for staying the extra 20 minutes. And um, I apologize to everybody else who did not get their questions asked, but we will keep this discussion going. Uh, we'll have a record of those questions. So uh, we will keep those in mind. Uh, and uh, again, we thank you everyone for joining us. And this resource will be up. Uh, and we hope to see you again when we have this second session. Um, so Dr. Fuentes, Dr. Sheffield, why don't we have a meeting maybe next week uh, to start planning for the, for the next stage? Shall we do that? Sure. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Goodbye.